Our two readings for this week are centered on knowledge and the idea of science. This tends to be the most difficult module for most students. Part of the difficulty is that, for the entirety of your education, you've been told a very nice and neat story about science and knowledge. That story has spent years burrowing itself in your psyche and settling in. And then, these readings come along and take an axe at the whole thing. If you take these ideas seriously, and you should, your entire concept of science, truth, progress, and how the world works will need to readjust. To clarify, I'm very much a fan of science, but I don't think we're doing the people or the science any favors by misrepresenting what it is and what it does. The first reading for the week was an excerpt from Al-Ghazali's Deliverance from Error, which is his autobiography. Before we get to the reading, it would be helpful to understand who's speaking here. Al-Ghazali was born in 1058 and died in 1111 at the age of 53. He has 400 plus books attributed to him, books on theology, governance, philosophy, mysticism, education, and so forth. Keep in mind that this was done back when writing a book required you to dip a stick in ink every word or so. He started writing at about the age of 30 when he finished his education, but in the 23 years he had left, he took a 10-year break, so all those books were written in 13 years of active work. Very interestingly, El Ghazali had developed a strong dislike for people offering comments on topics they did not have expertise on. He was particularly irritated by philosophers commenting on theology and theologians commenting on philosophy. Neither understood enough of the other discipline to do anything but cause confusion and chaos. That's why, when he ran into philosophy, El Ghazali spent two years reading all things philosophy, and then another year just organizing the information in his head. This process was essentially getting a PhD in a discipline just so he could talk about it coherently. Now, he comments on the idea of expertise in order to talk about things in the following way. He says, quote, I was convinced that a man cannot grasp what is defective in any of the sciences unless he has so complete a grasp of the science in question that he equals its most learned exponents in the appreciation of its fundamental principles and even goes beyond and surpasses them, probing into some of the tangles and profundities which the very professors of the science have neglected. Then, and only then, is it possible that what he has to assert about its defects is true. I realize that to refute a system before understanding it and becoming acquainted with its depth is to act blindly. So, now we know a bit about the author, let's go into the text. If you were wondering about all the religious phrasing in the introduction and elsewhere, I really hope you read the end notes in the reading. The reading itself is about 8 pages, but the end notes for that section are 9 pages long. That should be a pretty good indicator that the end notes are important to understanding the text. In fact, Always read the footnotes, endnotes, and all such material, because it helps make sure you're interpreting the ideas in the correct way. The introductory part is a standard style of writing at the time, regardless of the topic. If you picked up a physics book, you would have found the same kind of an introduction. As a bonus, this kind of introduction is supposed to humble the author and the reader into putting their egos aside and doing their best to focus on trying to get at the truth of the matter instead of pushing for whatever idea or bias they have. We've all been in the middle of an argument when we realize that we're wrong, but we don't want to admit that, we just want to keep pushing until we win, except that such a victory only feeds our ego and does nothing to help us get anywhere. Additional religious references are there for a few reasons. First, the author is a theologian and a devout Muslim, and the general assumption is that most of his intended audience would have been as well. Second, in several spots, he uses religious or semi-religious ideas to demonstrate how his argument also connects to religion. And third, he also credits the divine for an intellectual breakthrough that he was stuck on, because he didn't seem to be the source of this answer. It just popped into his head, unrelated from the direction of his own efforts, and so he doesn't take credit for something that he didn't actively do. As to the argument. Al-Ghazali says that he is looking for knowledge, truth, and certainty. And when he says certainty, he means something like 10 is greater than 3. This is an important point because this statement cannot be false, not even theoretically. You can't actually imagine that 3 is more than 10. I mean, we can write it down, but you can't conceptualize the idea. To put it a different way, this kind of certainty means that it can't be doubted even by an act of God. 
God may change the definitions, but then we would be talking about a different topic altogether. So long as you understand the numbers 10 and 3 and the idea of magnitude, which gives you the statement greater than, then you can be absolutely certain about the idea. So El Ghazali looks at different kinds of knowledge he has and concludes that all knowledge that he has from other people, even people who were the top authority on the issue, can't be certain. We can't even trust our parents to keep us from an eternity of afterlife punishment. They think they're giving us the truth, but because they can't uniformly decide which religion is right, they can't give us certain knowledge. And this is parents who would give their own lives to keep their children safe. If you can't trust the parents, who can you trust? Apparently no one other than yourself. Well, if all we have is ourselves, all we have are senses and reason. So if we're going to find certainty, it must be through senses and or reason. But it turns out our senses are unreliable. In fact, they misinterpret reality all the time. For example, all these horizontal lines are straight, but that's not what your eyes are telling you. And then you have this one, where your senses are telling you the circles are moving. They are not. Here's one of my favorites. Your senses tell you that the people in the back of this image are smaller, a lot smaller, unless you believe that people shrink as they walk away from you and grow as they approach you, you know that the senses are lying. Your senses can't even tell that this person is a whole person. What you see is chest, head, and arms above the table, and then the table, and then some legs. Your senses don't tell you this is a whole person. They also tell you that the man in the front has a head that's 19 times larger than the man in the back. So, senses are obviously not a way to get certainty. But when we use reason, it can judge the senses and all other things. And that's a part of us that tells us that people are not shrinking or growing, that the legs are in fact part of the torso, etc. So it looks like we finally found a cause of certainty. But here El Ghazali gets into serious trouble. The only way you can confirm that a thing works or doesn't work is by judging it from a higher level. That's why reason could judge senses. But what if there is a level above reason? Could it reveal that our reason is just as broken as our senses? How would we even know that such a level exists? And here, Ghazali uses the idea of dreams to make a point. When we dream, the world of dreams is perfectly rational. Never mind the flying hippo, apparently hippos just do that all the time. And when you wake up, only then do you realize just how insane and unreasonable and incoherent that dream was. What if what we call reality right now is just another dream? What if when we die, we actually just wake up and think this entire life was just a messed up dream, complete with flying hippos? You see, so long as we only know that there are two levels we're working with, this is easy enough to deal with. Senses are unreliable, but reason is reliable. Easy enough to know what you're dealing with. If your ideas only contain dreaming or awake, then it's fairly easy to understand the difference, because awake is not a state that we wake up from. And then that pyramid, senses and reason, makes perfect sense because the reason is the top. This is like the matrix. You're in the matrix or the real world. You can tell the difference by your surroundings and the inability to break the laws of nature. But what if there are more levels? If the senses are unreliable, but reason may also be unreliable, then what? If your ideas include dreaming, 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 and maybe awake, how do you know if you're ever actually awake? That's when this pyramid here may not work for you. This is not like the Matrix, it's like Inception, where waking up from a dream is no guarantee that you're back in reality. You could be in a shallower dream or a deeper one, and you never have any way of really knowing. If this is the case, then we can't trust our reason, at least not to give us certainty. Just like perception, it could be wildly wrong. But you may be thinking, why not just prove that reason works? Al Ghazali addresses that in the following way. If you have to demonstrate to someone that reason works, you would have to design some kind of an experiment to show that reason works. But to accept the experiment or its conclusions, the person would already have to be using reason. So they can't be the judge of reason. You see, the argument is broken because you're saying something like, First, assume that reason works, and then I can prove that reason works. No, no you can't, because you can't prove something that you have to assume is true. Now this idea ties back to the point we mentioned before. Facts are meaningless. Interpretation is what gives meaning to facts, but interpretation is only ever in our heads 
and is not part of the fact itself. This is why you can't prove something to a person who disagrees with you about the meaning of facts. You can keep on throwing facts at them, but nothing ever changes, because they never give them the same value you do, and that value is a metaphysical property. So El Ghazali is stuck. He can't trust reason, but he has no other way of getting past the problem. And here he comes to a critical discovery. This is the one that he attributes to God, but which is also understandable by the non-religious reader because you can understand it by using reason. The idea is as follows. The concepts that sit at the bottom of our systems of interpretation, at the core of our metaphysical systems, these ideas cannot be questioned. It's not that you should not question them, it's that you don't have the tools to question them. Instead, you have to assume them. If you assume that reason is capable of discovering the truth, then you can develop all sorts of procedures on top of that assumption to make it do all sorts of work for you. But the functionality of reason is forever an assumption, and must stay that way because all your explanations are based on making the assumption that reason works. These core level assumptions are also known as articles of faith. And so, Al-Ghazali concludes that we should always question all the things, but when we realize that we have dug down to the articles of faith, the digging doesn't make sense. That's where you should stop once you're sure that you're on the articles of faith. And you should stop, not because these articles of faith are somehow religious, you should stop because you no longer have the tools, and neither does anyone else, to make any sense of asking any further questions. Thomas Kuhn comes on scene almost 900 years after Al-Ghazali. He's a philosopher of science and flips the idea of science on its head when he publishes his Structure of Scientific Revolutions. A big point he makes is that the idea of science that we've been pushing for about 300 years is not just wrong, it's nowhere near reality. Part of his analysis came from the fact that it started becoming more apparent to historians of science that it is impossible to determine who discovered what and when. For example, if you discover a new element but don't realize it, and think instead that you're looking at a funny version of an old one, did you actually discover anything? What about if you announce that you have discovered a new element, but it turns out that your experiments were all wrong, but then it also turns out that the idea about this new element is ultimately correct? Who gets the credit? Can we say that we know what a thing is if we don't know much about it? That is, if our definition of what it is and isn't is wrong? So that's a headache. But it gets worse. The standard assumption was that old civilizations were all about myths, like Zeus. But when you examine old science, it's no more mythical in its work than modern science. It's very different, to be sure, and was far more technologically primitive but it does more or less the same things we do today, and this leads us to Kuhn's line from the first chapter. The more carefully they study, say, Aristotelian dynamics, phlogistic chemistry, or caloric thermodynamics, the more certain they feel that those once current views of nature were, as a whole, neither less scientific nor more the product of human idiosyncrasy than those current today. If these out-of-date beliefs are to be called myths, then myths can be produced by the same sorts of methods and held for the same sorts of reasons that now lead to scientific knowledge. If, on the other hand, they are to be called science, then science has included bodies of belief quite incompatible with the ones we hold today. Well, what's the problem here? A few things, including the fact that revolutions, including scientific ones, are not peaceful affairs. Heads roll, things are destroyed, not exactly the image of science, is it? But the most damning problem is that, because revolutions destroy the previous systems, it means that the nice story you heard about cumulative progress of science is total garbage. I'm sure you've all heard the standing on the shoulders of giants line. Well, that's the idea of cumulative progress. But we don't stand on the shoulders of giants. We kill them and throw their bodies into a ditch, and then we become the giants. So let's demonstrate exactly what Kuhn means here. The idea that science stacks like Legos would look something like this. This would indicate that we have a kind of upward trajectory. We were more ignorant in the past, then we discovered things, and then we spent a lot of time getting closer to the truth, and that's where we should be now. The whole process is or was directed at arriving at truth about the world. 
over time we build up out of ignorance and towards the truth which is where we are it's a great little story but it's a shame it's about as real as harry potter the reality if you actually look at the history of science and the development of science and the way that science is practiced is something more like this what you have here is a broken line because we don't build on old science we throw it all out that line doesn't go up or down because there is no vertical axis there is not truth anywhere on this graph why not because every science and theory ever has claimed that it has the truth that's why people went into that field of study because it's kind of hard to get people to sign up if you're pitching it as we may be entirely wrong join us and possibly waste your life now as Ghazali pointed out we don't have any access to the truth all we have are rational ideas on the basis of articles of faith but articles of faith are arbitrary and can't be checked so because you don't know what truth looks like how would you know it if you saw it because we throw out every theory we can't be getting closer to the truth the previous theory replaced the even older version because it was supposed to be closer to the truth but then we threw that out too so it wasn't any closer was it the line breaks and then another line picks up in the same spot and keeps going over time until it too breaks and so on this means that we have a theory we believe right up until we don't and then we replace it with a new theory which we believe until we don't you see why the idea of getting closer to the truth makes no sense right new theories and scientific revolutions don't simply adjust the old ideas to be closer to the truth because there is no meaningful way of adjusting them imagine you're blindfolded in a pitch black room given a gun and told to hit a target you fire a shot but you can't hear the bullet hit anything or even fall so how exactly do you adjust with no feedback how do you claim that your change in direction gets you closer to hitting the target you don't even know that there is a target in the room with you another analogy might be driving without knowing where you're headed sure you're moving but you can't say that you're any closer or further away from your destination because you don't know what that destination is you need a reference point and frankly with truth there just isn't one because we don't have a magical bell in our heads to let us know when we're right we have no idea whether we're ever any closer or further from the truth but you may be saying the fact that we have cell phones man on the moon satellites computers and things like that surely this is proof we're right it's proof that our ideas about getting closer to the truth are true otherwise these things wouldn't work well no not even a little bit this is partially why we read about the old civilizations last week sumerians had a lot of ways of managing their problems for telling the future with enough accuracy to stay alive so on they were the water rider but just like the water rider the functionality of the idea is unrelated to its truth do you believe that the pharaohs were gods no you don't but the functionality of their sciences was so amazing that four and a half thousand years later their projects still stand just because your idea works doesn't mean it's based on truth it just means that it works look when we designed the steam engine that drove from one ocean to the other we had an understanding of physics that has been entirely thrown away since no one today believes any of the things we believed about physics back then but the steam engine worked and still does in physics textbooks in 1895 they were absolutely sure that space flight was impossible because there was nothing to push against in space at the same time we were designing cars cars that worked even when our ideas about the nature of reality were apparently wrong by today's standards this is the difference between truth and functionality you can have false but functional ideas in fact it looks like just about all of our ideas are false but functional functional just means that the world does what you expect it to when you behave a certain way that's the how truth of the matter is why and as we noted why is a metaphysical question what science is is a bunch of theoretical ideas backed by practical demonstrations but all of that is based entirely and i do mean entirely on a series of assumptions that lie at the core of each science if you change those assumptions you get different series of theoretical ideas equally backed by demonstration we thought that rocks fell down because they desired to be near other rocks essentially they're trying to hug the other rocks but regardless of that false belief we built massive projects that have remained standing for thousands of years as for those assumptions 
you may be wondering how bad the situation really is. So let's just consider a few assumptions that no science can survive without. 1. The external world exists more or less as we experience it. If we don't assume this, we can't interact with the world in any kind of a meaningful way. But there is no reason why the world must be as we experience it. For example, while the screen in front of you is solid to the touch, it's also made up of essentially nothing, because the inside of every atom is over 99% emptiness. In fact, if you were to compress all 7 billion humans together so that there was no space between their subatomic particles, all 7 billion of us would add up to the size of an apple. Here's another one. The world is orderly and governed by universal laws. There is no reason to suppose that the world is actually orderly. There is certainly no reason to suppose that 98% of the universe that we have not and can't see is at all like the parts that we have seen. But unless you assume that, there is no way of doing science because science is all about rules and laws that apply beyond your little lab experiment. Oddly enough, this belief used to be justified by the general belief in God, because then there is a reason why the universe would be orderly, because someone made it orderly. 3. The world is comprehensible to us. If we don't assume that the world can be comprehended, and that our intellect is good enough to comprehend it, then there is no purpose in trying to study it. That would be like a fish trying to learn calculus. Sorry fish, not enough capacity to grasp it. But there is no reason to suppose that our brains can actually grasp the rules and laws of the universe. Chimps are only a few percent different than humans genetically, and that's the difference between throwing poop at one another and the entirety of human civilization. 4. And this one is most critical in physics, although the other sciences are pretty reliant on it too. The events in the world can be represented by mathematical equations. Why that should be the case is entirely unclear, but if it isn't, there would be no point in doing physics, because physics is all about representing the events in the world through mathematical equations. Oh, and keep in mind that we can't even figure out whether mathematics is something we discover or something that we invent. So here are four assumptions so critical to science that the very idea of science is not possible without them. But at the same time, there is no way to prove any of this. In fact, these ideas suffer from the same problem as El Ghazali's attempt to defend reason. There are also a lot more assumptions built into science, but there is little point of going into them here. If we accept the idea that science is not about the truth, and that it rests on the same kind of assumptions as every metaphysical system, we don't lose science. In fact, I think we get a much better idea of what science is and what it does. While we don't have a nice neat little story to tell elementary school kids, we do have a much more rational idea. This new idea lets us appreciate and invest in science without thinking of science as magic and scientists as wizards. This also lets us get away from the badly articulated ideas about secular modernity as the sole source of the truth, and that actually lets us look at the past to see how we can learn from it. Instead of thinking of the people in the past as somehow savage, we understand that they're essentially like us, but working with a different set of assumptions and a different metaphysical system then we can properly engage with their ideas and advance our own. I doubt that any scientist alive would not trade a lung for the opportunity to discover how any of the massive civilizational achievements we mentioned in Module 4 were achieved by these savage peoples.